Well, I'm sad to say something is rotten in the state of Queensland. Hospitals are dysfunctional, patients wait anxiously in record ramping, wondering if they'll even get into the hospital before it's too late. School underperformance, well, that's an understatement. Based on the 2023 NAPLAN results, Queensland lags behind the country on almost every measure, and that's with national standards also on the slide. The child safety system persistently fails our most vulnerable kids, prioritising the needs and wishes of adults with big problems over the needs of children for stable, loving homes. Maternal health is in crisis in the regions. Billa Wheeler reached a year on bypass for maternity services last Friday. Ingham and Cooktown are also on bypass and Weeper isn't properly open either. Theodore and Chinchilla have been permanently downgraded against the wishes of local communities just to get them out of the headlines. Citizens, good private people who wouldn't ordinarily dream of being activists are marching in the streets as they did just last week to protest against government inaction on persistently high crime rates. Last year, Queensland had the highest number of victims of crime in the country. It's up 15%. It's the dubious holder of the title of car theft capital of the country, with assault crimes up more than 60% and sexual offences up 14%, robbery up over 18% and domestic violence breaches up more than 16% in just a year. This is not some media beat-up. And yet, the Labor member for Capalaba on Brisbane's Bayside described it that way. Don't take my word for it. After all, I guess I'm a member of the media these days. Take the word of the many people who are working outside of law enforcement to try and keep their communities safe. And some of their messages are on the screen just here. The really scary part is, well, there's a lot of messages here, but they're just a drop in the ocean. And it's just one suburb, one middle-class Brisbane suburb that's reflected here. Replicate this kind of experience statewide and we are talking about a disaster of epic proportions. So, to the member for Kapalaba who thinks it's just a media beat up, ask Russell and Anne Field who lost their son Matthew and his pregnant fiance Kate Ledbetter and their unborn son to a 17-year-old in an out-of-control stolen car, high on drugs. Ask them whether it's just a beat-up. It's very hard for us and other victims of, of juvenile crime. Um, it's, it's a little bit disappointing. Nothing seems to happen, no matter, no matter, no matter what. Um, like we said here some time ago, and it's been two years now since Kate and uh, Matt and Miles were, were killed on this corner, and, and nothing appears to be happening. Uh, we've said in the past that if something concrete was done two years ago when we called for it and others, um, some of these current offences may not have happened. Sadly, Mr and Mrs Field and the family they love, they're not the only victims. There's far too many for me to be able to list. Well, this week, the same MP, Don Brown, tried to blame youth crime on... Wait for it, John Howard, a long bow if ever I've seen one, for his efforts to encourage more Australians to have children. Well, it's a bit of a clunker. The uncomfortable fact is that these awful crimes are the product of Labor policy that's watered down youth justice laws, reduced the likelihood of meaningful penalties being imposed for crimes, under-resourced diversionary programs that undermine parental and community early intervention for people at risk of offending. It doesn't help that the justice system is ill-served by a forensic and scientific services system that the Sofronoff inquiry held was affected by grave maladministration involving dishonesty, leading to the need to revisit outcomes in over 7,000 cases. It's good to see some of those being revisited now. And that's in addition to the backlog that a magistrate said in May was 10,000 cases long. Well, no wonder victims aren't getting justice. And Queensland Labor are running the state with the kind of thuggish bullying tactics that might be at home at the CFMEU, but that are wholly inappropriate 
in the halls of parliament. As mining businesses plead with the government for economic conditions that make future investment in the state viable, the treasurer who jacked up royalties to the highest level in the world threatens to revoke existing and paid for property rights for businesses facing that impossible choice. Queenslanders are groaning under the strain of the soaring cost of living, and yet Labor imposes more taxes, despite a promise at the last election that there would be no new or increased taxes. Do you remember this? There are no cuts to services and there are no new or increased taxes. I remember it. I reckon you do too. Breaking that promise, Labor have pursued higher royalties, a new mental health tax on business, a new gaming tax and policy changes that amount to a renter's tax and a tax on GPs. And as a housing crisis grips the state and construction costs soar, the government continues to constrain the release of land by councils, double down on eco-extremist laws that make property development more expensive and indulge procurement policies that artificially inflate the cost of building. Instead of making Queensland an attractive place for property investment, the government floats populist rental caps with the effect of actually making it less attractive than ever for mum and dad investors, as over 70% of Queensland's landlords are, to be a part of the solution for lower rents, that is, greater rental property supply. And there isn't even basic competence in what should be routine government business. Transport Minister Bailey and the Premier have been caught out trying to conceal a $2.4 billion blowout on a train contract, train building contract. And the Cross River Rail project has blown out by $960 million and will be delivered about a year late. It's representative of a pattern of failing to deliver on time or on target. It seems like it's just an announcement and then nothing happens. I could keep going. You know, mismanagement of fisheries, waste on projects like the Wellcamp quarantine facility, leaving taxpayers $223 million poorer and without any infrastructure to show for it. Recycling policy that's created an incentive to direct more waste to landfill. Hospital patients being put up at SeaWorld because the mismanagement means they don't fit in hospitals. Last year, there were more spin doctors added by Queensland's government than there were police officers. Nothing like the over 2,000 officers promised at the last election. And while commodity prices, you know, have provided a spike in revenues, as has a spike in property transfer duties, state coffers have boosted substantially. Despite that, the state is still charging towards $130 billion in debt. I haven't even touched on the excesses of power that sent businesses to the wall, wielded mandates to kick people out of their jobs and tore families apart during the COVID era. Now, it would probably take a whole show, maybe longer, to list all of Queensland Labor's failures, so I won't. Instead, let's ask a question. What will it take for Queenslanders to say, enough? And even in the midst of this crisis, the Premier headed overseas on a secret two-week holiday, showing just how checked out the red carpet Premier has become. Now, I'm not knocking you for having a holiday, but this is the very same behaviour for which Labor happily crucified Scott Morrison just a few years ago. So, while those who hope to succeed Premier Palaszczuk are dusting off their manifestos and declaring that they find all of this stuff fun, they should instead grapple with what is a very serious reality. And that reality is the Queenslanders are in crisis and that ditching the Premier right now doesn't fix that crisis and indeed it could leave an untalented and incompetent team. For these failures are not just the Premier's, they cover every area of policy responsibility for her ministers would leave them without even the veneer of non-threatening warmth that has carried Ms Palaszczuk through many a scandal. It's time for new leadership in this state. Leadership that will govern for all and not just provide patronage to union mates. 
Leadership that will allow the many and diverse talents of Queenslanders to shine without the heavy hand of government always holding them back. Where entrepreneurial types can have a go and where people can get the services they need when they need them. Where parents have the tools to raise their kids with confidence and get them a world-class education that aligns with their values. Where Labor's waste, incompetence and sovereign risk are placed are replaced with delivery, stability and the confidence to invest. Where people can look to the future and know that their very best days are ahead of them. Yep, it is time for change. Not for its own sake, but because Labor no longer knows why it is in government. It's clinging on only for the perks of raw power itself. It's time for a new government, one that respects voters, that honours its commitments, that attracts prosperity and plans for the future.